Hello there, and welcome to Weird Music on the Glumberger channel. This is of course a show where we dive into albums of all sorts, shapes and sizes and, you know, discuss what they're about and get the word out there that you know about these different kinds of music essentially. <laughs> so, in today's episode, we will be returning to Dragon's Eye Recordings with a look at one of my favourite albums from 2023. Um, this was an album that was released back in April of that year, and it genuinely took me a long time to get around to discussing it on the channel, but I'm glad I eventually found the time to do so, because it's such a, like, it's such a beautiful, lovely existential album experience, I feel, that's really warm and intimate at times. I'm excited to talk about this one. Today, I present to you King Lee by A Wave, A Mouth. And so, and so, let's of course ask ourselves, who is A Wave A Mouth? Well, A Wave A Mouth is a queer-identifying, non-binary, post-disciplinary composer, recording artist and spatial practitioner, living and working in London and Taipei. And having released a couple of uh, albums on various record labels, A Wave A Mouth is slowly making a name for themselves as a composer who is guided by their own personal experiences, as well as research in architecture, uh, phenomenology and cosmology, with their work specifically examining the process of constructing a coherent sense of and understanding of reality itself from the relationship between their self and the world itself. <laughs> And as a result, uh, a wave of mouth's music comes across as you know, this beautiful existential free-flowing experience that guides itself through a multitude of emotions, you know, examining an understanding of the world as well as with themselves, of course. And so, of course, uh, we're looking at the wonderful album King Lee, released on none other than Jan Novak's record label Dragon's Eye Recordings, of course, uh, as well as have been mastered by the one and only Lawrence English at Negative Space. And so, uh, this is a six-track album uh, that slowly guides itself through a journey of exploration into the known realities of the world around us, and the new realities born from love that doesn't align with any rational, social or political realities. And it's a rather, you know, uh, existential little experience at times, but it's one that is just truly beautiful to behold, I feel, and one that feels so, as mentioned, just warm and intimate, you know, being a perfect expression of love that doesn't fall under binary rules. So let's discuss its tracks then, shall we? <laughs> So King Lee opens up with Anchor Concurrent Waltz, eight minutes of fantastic building of emotion and presence through the use of percussion, beats, field recordings, and pianos, etc, etc, that instantly just drop us into the smouldering atmospheric soundscape. I love how this album opens up with these rather intense sounding beats that end up you know, becoming this eventual drift into these pecu wonderful peculiarities of sound itself. And much like the liner notes, it feels like, um, much like the liner notes mentions, I mean, <laughs> it feels like time is being played around with a bit, as we're not given a specific structure in terms of the beats, but rather it's perhaps a textual element of the song itself. And what I love is the beautiful and seamless transition into the tra track's second half of Concurrence Waltz, where the piano becomes the driving force for the track, you know, uh, coming across as a beautiful, natural sounding twinkling of gentle, fragile notes, offset by these rather peculiar textures that, you know, make the whole composition feel really connected to the outside world, if that makes any sense almost like a, you know, an observation and consideration of everything around us, perhaps. 
and the multitude of textural sounds, you know, it becomes a little bit difficult to discern exactly, but, you know, I feel that perhaps there's a pointlessness in doing so, as they're all just helping to push along this very intimate and lovely sounding narrative, expressed to us through the use of abstract sound, of course. It's a truly beautiful opening track that feels like the battling of two halves almost as well, you know, colliding together in a confused fashion as, you know, perhaps they're trying to make sense of each other, if that makes sense. Let's move along though, we get to the next track of A Kiss and a Sting, where we're introduced to these incredibly hushed, just indiscernible vocals where the piano gently descends upon these lower notes, creating an incredibly beautiful atmospheric soundscape. And there are some lovely effects at play here, you know, you get the colliding of objects, the movement of water, and you know, it all helps to create this very lovely flow, pun intended, to the entire composition as it just gently guides itself. And what I really like is how there's, it feels like there's this incredibly fragile element to so much of the composition, as though it's almost at risk of just falling apart under the weight of everything happening. But the more it continues, it's almost like it becomes much more assured of itself, you know? It's still being representative of something different at the same time, if that makes sense. Now, there's such an incredible abstract nature to it all, but it's all just so pleasant sounding and just beautiful at times. And even when it just immerses itself in a rather melancholy sound, it's still incredibly beautiful as well. Let's just uh, get to the next track though. Uh, we get track three of Our Circular In Between, which I really like as a title, uh, track title, by the way. <laughs> it's one of those lovely combination of words that just paints this really lovely vivid picture, I feel. Like so much of the album does, to be perfectly fair. In any case, uh, this is the longest track on the album, just shy of nine minutes, and I feel like this is perhaps a real culmination of the very themes and concept of this album, you know, both in terms of what it's representing and also in terms of how it's just literally sounding as well. You're getting these incredibly carefully placed piano melodies, you know, that unfurl momentarily before giving room for this percussive beat and these you know, incredibly gentle airy drones that just um, that just drift by so perfectly, I feel. <laughs> and I love the voices that appear in this one. You know, they just fade into the scene, you know, in a, with a, in a swell of volume before being snatched away back into the recesses of, you know, whence they came, essentially. And it creates this, you know, very abstract and, uh, you know, rather surreal listening experience, but it just slowly smoulders as it all progresses along, you know. No, never once feeling intimidating or overbearing, but as mentioned, just oddly beautiful in its own sense, as though it's expressing itself for exactly what it is and nothing else. But what's truly beautiful though about this particular track is in the halfway point of this composition, everything just suddenly opens up into this incredibly abstract combination of beats and notes, you know, creating this really lovely dance in amongst the very composition itself. And I feel this, this moment is perhaps, you know, just, it comes across to me as a wonderful celebration of identity and love, you know, and perhaps is, uh, and also as well. Um, it also uh, leads into a really lovely uh, part towards the end of the track, where you get a really charming and intimate moment on the whole album, um, punctuated by a spoken word passage from guest performer, and whom I assume is the titular King Lee, Lena uh, Chu Han. It's all of those things, being scared and excited, being cautious and open. I read somewhere that fear is excitement without breath. And maybe we can find a way to slow down further, perhaps partaking in the mundane things. And most importantly, perhaps always leaving or creating space for the breath, for the slowing down and letting things be without interference. And so this is a lovely little passage. Um, it feels like a bit of a summary of sorts or a representation of the album's theme through words this time. 
And as mentioned, it's a truly lovely moment on this album. And I love what's being presented here, you know, just a sort of gentle recommendation of just taking pause to consider it all, essentially. And what I find interesting as well, you know, just to continue discussing here, um, uh, I, I think that a lot of what is being said is kind of like my experience of ambient music in general, if that makes sense. It's, I find music like this and ambient music and electronic music, it's a truly phenomenal way to just slow everything down and become mindful of everything, including the mundane, the ordinariness of existing. And there's perhaps an element of, you know, stress uh, being expressed here in these words, the way fear can dictate emotion, but even then, that's just a part of existence in itself as well, and there's, in the true sense of existentialism, you know, the whole range of emotions, there's just something so exciting and interesting about everything, essentially. Let's move along, though. We get to the next track of Concurrence, Reprise and Hope. And this takes us back to the second half of the opening track again, though it feels a little bit more minimal on this one. And there's a sense of, you know, melancholy emotion running through the instrumentals, you know, uh, whilst you're sort of given this image of rain just trickling past right by, by the windows before we then move into a beautiful contemplative drone section to draw the track to a close. And I like this drone a lot because it brings with it a sort of stillness to this very moment on the album, as though the world is continuing to move around us, or whilst we just remain in place, you know, still feeling this array of emotions that we as humans feel. Um, we then also move on to the album's shortest track of To Become a Dragonfly, which is another beautiful name for a track, I feel. I just love how you sort of just get these vivid images through these words, essentially. And this one opens up with, you know, just a lovely melody of gentle, almost minimal notes, you know, that slowly become backed up by a lovely array of instruments to help expand the sonic palette, supported by the rumbling of microsound electronics and drones. And I love how the textures seem to slowly evolve over the course of this one, you know, giving the sense of a transformative experience, you know. Especially uh, when towards the end, you just get this beautiful flurry of what sounds like acoustic strings being plucked away, almost like a kind of folk instrument, I would say. And, you know, once again, it's slightly existential to an extent, but also, once again, just so incredibly beautiful as well, you know, and I would say this is perhaps one of my favourite tracks on this album as a result, you know, there's just something so lovely, warm and intimate about it, as well as being so contemplative to an extent as well. Following on from this, uh, we move on to the album's final track of She Wears the Crown, which uh, you know, gently opens up with a simmering of layers that all flow into the scene. You get wonderful piano notes that twist and turn into each other in this lovely fashion, backed up by rather subtle drones that slowly build it all up again. But I truly adore this track though, you know, when roughly a minute and a half in, you just get this very gentle bass notes appearing in the composition that create this almost beating pulse for the track, I would say, you know, slowly guiding uh, it towards the next movement of the composition itself, you know, which then becomes, you know, accompanied by the appearance of incredibly hushed vocals that are very indiscernible, of course, but so textural in the way they sound. Once again, once again, something so truly beautiful and lovely about this one, especially when we get some of those brief field recordings of vo voices talking to each other, like hidden behind those uh, processed vocals, you know, that are that sounding rather expansive in the mix, you know, but those brief, uh, just you can kind of just hear that faint chatter of the, from these two people, and it becomes such a lovely little snapshot of a moment in life, you know, a, a brief moment of intimacy between two people, you know, just being themselves, you know. And I love as well the ending of this track. You know, that gentle bass note that introduced itself earlier has continued throughout the entire thing, guiding through all the different movements, guiding it all the way to the end, which is now backed up by these incredibly gentle and lovely vocal drones that, for some reason, when I hear it, it just puts a bit of a smile on my face when I hear it, you know. I think it's a really beautiful way to end this album, and another one of my favourite tracks off this whole thing, essentially. 
And thus with that, we've essentially covered uh, King Lee by A Wave of Mouth. And as I've mentioned, I truly adore this record and have done since I heard it back in April 2023. And I just love how it navigates such an array of emotions and, under and an understanding of emotion through the use of abstract, non-vocal electronic music. I mean, although there's vocals in it, they're not used as vocal performances, if that makes sense, more just like these droning textures. But as well, it seems that there's a real sense of structure on this album as well, though, you know, beginning with this consideration of how love exists in the current day to day. As um, and then guiding it into a much more interpersonal relationship by the end, you know? Love for the ones in our lives who enrich it and make it better, if that makes sense. Musically as well, there's a lot more beats and percussion in the album's first half before moving into these incredibly gentle droning passages in the second half, perhaps giving a sense, you know, an understanding to the sort of two halves thing that's uh, discussed in the uh, Bandcamp's liner notes. Um, uh, which is sort of uh, mentioned as a known reality and a new reality. And it makes me think, you know, whilst the world today does feel so incredibly scary and tumultuous, taking time to consider and express love to those important to us, you know, um, is not only important, but it's incredibly needed these days. And I feel like this album does so in such a really beautiful way, I feel. It's truly phenomenal. And so before we close off though, I'm actually incredibly happy to say that in preparation for this video, I reached out to A Wave A Mouth to ask a little bit more about this record, um, as well as asking about themselves and their processes when making music. And to my delight, um, they responded and their answers give us so much context and understanding to this record. And, and you know, one that has really stuck with me throughout this, uh, the whole of 2023, essentially. And so this is uh, another sort of interview that I'll just be reading out verbatim for all of you, so I do hope you enjoy this. I'm curious as to the moniker chosen for this project. A wave, a mouth. Could you explain a bit more as to what is behind this name, as well as the use of punctuation? The name is taken from the opening of Sea and Fog, the beautiful collection of poetry and prose by Etel Ardenen. The full paragraph reads as follows. A wave, a mouth. A horse arrives, submits, drowns. Streaked and bleeding sky. What is sky? To climb mountain peaks to overlook clouds. Water on water reverberates memory's mechanism. Who is the titular King Lee? And what about them inspired the creation of this album experience? King Lee is my partner in life. I met her when I was in a state of becoming more of myself, and she embraced me there with a warmth and love that I didn't expect. King Lee is also a metaphor of the love I feel for her, this love that, that reaches far beyond the binary frames that dictate so much of our lives under heteropatriarchal colonial capitalism. It is a love that doesn't demand, but hopes, that doesn't project, but experiences. A love that exists in the search for an in-between. King Lee is an embodiment of this radical queer love. What informed the creative process behind the particular sounds we hear on King Lee? At the time of conceptualising the body of work that became King Lee, I was in the process of moving to and then finding a footing in a new country. It was a stressful period and I was in a deeply transitional state as a result of it. So I ended up with these opposing forces that manifested in the music. I wanted to make something that felt sweet and confident, but then it was imbued with that tran transience and stress of life that at, uh, at that time, ending up sounding quite fragile and haunted also. I really enjoyed distilling the tension of these two colliding realities, the idea of my feelings and the materiality of lived experience. There's a very abstract nature to the instrumentals. Was it guided by improvisation or a sense of composition in the creation of something specific? I think it was a process of finding a creative balance of multiple poles. 
On one hand, I was trying to capture a specific feeling of love and closeness, which felt like a very descriptive process. On the other hand, I also wanted to allow the evolving realities of life to influence the process. The stresses of moving, of sharing a new home, of having to make a living wage, of assumptions and projections about the nature of the relationship and relationships in general, both from within and without. All of these have an impact on the possible scope of relating to one another, and then had an impact on the creative decisions I made, the sonic qualities I was drawn to, etc. As such, this was a far more transient part of the creative process, quite adaptive and improvised. And on a third hand, I had this notion of radical hope I wanted to convey, of reaching for a divine in-between, and finding comfort in the unknown if you will. I guess I would call that aspect of the process prescriptive, more reliant on faith than on material experience. I mentioned when you first sent me this album back in April that there is an, this intimate sense of love and hope that comes through in the music. Is this something you'd agree with? Absolutely, and I love that you picked up and took note of this. I believe in hope as a practice, not as a feeling. Choosing hope when the material conditions, the realities of the world tell you that there is none, is a quite radical act, full of faith and proactive momentum towards building new worlds and new ways of relating to one another. There's a lot of themes that run through the entirety of King Lee, love that doesn't align with any rational, social or political realities, but rather creates a new reality of its own from nothing. Could you further extrapolate on that? Despite much needed progress in the acceptance of gay relationships over the past few decades, there is still a prevailing rejection and vilification of any form of relationship that doesn't adhere to what Paul Pre Presadio calls the regime of sexual difference. The hegemonic reality forced upon us all continues to insist that love is intrinsically connected to dynamics of domination, power and binary differenti differentiations. I I however, I found that when I feel when I say love, that pure sensation that in truth escapes capture by a single word does not at all connect with the prescriptions of reality I was taught my whole life. So in a situation where the reality of the world doesn't reflect our experience, we only have one choice, to create a new world, a new realm of knowledges, acceptances and emotions that does provide the space capable of embracing and holding our experience, and that also remains pliable for future evolutions of experiential reality. Sometimes it's a bit of a common question, but I've always be in, been interested in knowing what music communicates to people. What have been some of your favourite albums artists from over the years regardless of genre? It's cliché to say, but there really are too many to make a comprehensive list. My favourite band growing up was Nine Inch Nails, and I still love most everything Trent Reznor touches. I also love Nick Cave's work, From Her to Eternity was one of the first records I ever bought, and Ghostine was such a hauntingly beautiful culmination of his output over the last decade or so. Although his cultural takes over the last few years were rather questionable in his blindness toward the, towards the realities of lived politics in the world. I adore live rust from Neil Young and Crazy Horse, Nicholas Jar's Siren, Telephone Tel Aviv's Dreams Are Not Enough, Hopelessness by Anohuni, Black Mirror by Arcade Fire, for You and I by Lorraine James, Emozioni by Lucio Battisti, Gangs by And So I Watch You From Afar, Our hangs, Hands Against the Dusk by Rachika Na, Naya, Imagine Naked by Oh Young, The Latest Offerings from Colin Stetson, When We Were That Wet for the Sea, and Yokabi Kariku, Feeling Body, and Wayne Shorter's Speak No Evil, all in equal measure at different times and for different reasons. Have there been any albums artists that have influenced and guided your explorations into music? Yes, of course. Raphael Anton Israi, Claire Rousey, Nicholas Shah, Telephone Tel Aviv, Oh Young and Cara Lee's Coverdale have all strongly influenced the kind of sound I am interested in creating. 
lyrically and often conceptually, I take inspiration from Matt Berenger, and from the writing of Ben Lerner, and the entire body of work of Saul Williams. I'm curious to know how King Lee ended up getting released on Dragon's Eye Recordings, a wonderful label representing marginalised voices. What, what's it like releasing on Jan Novak's record label? I reached out to the label when I first finished my second EP, uh, First Beat, and Jan, to my utter surprise, responded and said he had a slot available on DER in April 2023, and that I could either choose either uh, either release First Beast or anything else I'd want to. I ended up finding a different home for First Beast, so then began creating what became King Lee. He is incredibly supportive, encouraging and welcoming, and I encountered so many beautiful artists through his label. I am glad to have made that connection. Is there anything planned for the future under the A Wave A Mouth moniker? I certainly hope so. I am actively working on two new projects at the moment. One is a composition and a long form poem about the coming of a collapsed reality, a shared phenomenology and empathy. The other one is part of a larger project, part critical analysis of nation states, part speculative fiction about alternative forms of collective organization outside of the entanglement with capitalism. Both are very much works in progress, but I do hope to release something this coming year. And so, yep, a huge thank you to A Wave A Mouth for taking the time to answer these questions, you know, and as mentioned before, as someone who identifies as both, you know, queer and non-binary and, you know, it, technically in a hetero relationship as well, I feel so much understanding from a record like this that managed to express you know, these, these notions of love and understanding, but without the use of words, through the use of mus musical movements that guide, you know, emotions and feelings themselves, essentially. And in the world today, you know, queer love of all forms feels very much under attack and, in general, so incredibly misunderstood, you know. You know? But, you know, people out there still coming together in celebration of, you know, love and identity, because regardless of the actions of those who are louder, essentially, you know, love will prevail because love cannot be destroyed by words and actions. It's something inherent deep within us that we feel. And, you know, as well, the mere fact that we can feel this way is something truly astounding, in my opinion. And I have to say, like, what a beautiful album that expresses these, you know, rather confusing existential notions, but does so so perfectly through instrumental music. And so, yeah, I think with that, we've come to the end of our episode of Weird Music there, you know. Once again, really glad to have taken the time to discuss one of my favourite albums of 2023 again. Now, this album just had an incredibly peculiar, profound and existential impact upon me when I first heard it. And I have to mention as well, you know, another thanks to A Wave of Mouth. Um, I was incredibly lucky and fortunate to have been given a download code for the album to add it to my Bandcamp collection as well, which was... So nice because, you know, you can only stream things so many times on Bandcamp. <laughs> but I, as mentioned, I truly adore the warm, intimate nature of this album that deals with, you know, many facets of existentialism, but all in the name of something truly hopeful and beautiful. A phenomenal album experience, in my opinion. <laughs> and so, yeah, once again, huge thank you to A Wave of Mouth for taking part in this episode and letting us know much more about themselves and this very album as well. So yeah, I would like to thank you for watching uh, today's episode of Weird Music. I wish you all the best. Take care and bye bye for now. Bye bye. <laughs>